Okay, if you'd like to go ahead and turn and mark 552. Our invitation song here in a few minutes will be number 552. Before our lesson, let's sing song number 522. 522. We'll begin with a prayer. Debbie Robertus uh, gave a note saying needs prayers for her daughter's mother-in-law, Terry Campbell. Her only kidney has a tumor. Doctor said surgery would be a 90% chance of losing it. So that's a, that's a bad deal. Um, glad that Wayne is here with us. I was scared he was going to miss Bible class tonight and I was going to have to go go. So bad, but now he's right here, and uh, so grateful that that all passed well, and grateful that y'all are here. Um, Nikki Wallace is getting out of Encompass tomorrow morning. They said about eight o'clock, but you know that time doesn't mean much in some places. And uh, Connie Bangs was uh, cheerful, doing okay. And um, we're just have so many that are recovering, and and uh, we certainly want to remember Phyllis Hance and the loss of Bob, and we want to just pray for all those who are hurting and struggling at this time. We also want to celebrate Elijah and Elena were baptized. Y'all stand up in case we won't see you. Come on, Elena, stand up. Elena wants. There's Elijah standing up. Elena standing up. <laughs> Happy for Dorothy and the whole family. There's never a better decision you'll make than the decision to be God's child, and we are grateful for you. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you so very, very much, and Father, we are grateful. We come to you with so many needs. Uh, we pray that you'll be with Terry Campbell and her kidney surgery. Pray that you'll continue to be with Wayne, that you'll be with Nikki, Connie, and the others who are in facilities right now. Father, we pray that you will be with Phyllis and those who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray that you will be with all of those who continue to recover. In this world, our bodies just fail us. They just... Uh, break down on us and and father it's a struggle for us when that happens but it really helps to have people that love you pray and pray for you and care for you and father we pray that we will always be responsive to the needs of one another may you bless us as we study and may we all be like elena and elijah and just do what your word says we're so thankful for the commitment they made today and we promise as a congregation to help them grow up in Christ Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 522, O God, our help in ages past. You know it's a good one when it's from the 1700s. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast And our eternal home And our eternal home Beneath the shadows of thy throne Thy saints have dwelt secure Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure, and our defense is sure. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shall be thou our guard while life shall last and our eternal home 
and our eternal home. I never know when it's going to be one of those songs that we sing all the time in Dumas, and it wasn't sung everywhere, but that song has meant a lot to me the last couple of months as we've studied Esther on Sunday morning. God has been doing it for so long. Throughout human history, He's been coming to the rescue of His people. And He sustains us, and He keeps us, and He holds us. That's certainly something to celebrate. We're talking about what this country really needs. We based our lesson on two incredible texts. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through verse 17, and Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through verse 28, because this is what America really needs, to have God's ethic, God's morality, God's decisions, God's wisdom, and to do the very core thing that Jesus told us all to do. That's to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love our neighbor as ourself. I was thinking today just about that last part, loving our neighbor as ourselves. We live in a really angry world. I did something I don't normally do. I try to stay away from the news channels and all that because it just makes me frustrated. But I decided to spend 20 minutes on Fox News, 20 minutes on CNN, and 20 minutes on MSNBC. My lunch just did not settle correctly for some reason. But I was sitting there and I was watching that, and in every case, everybody was so mad. Everybody was so angry. And I thought, this isn't news. This is people ranting about something they hear in the news. I remember the news. Paul Harvey told me the news at 8 o'clock every morning at noon at 5.15 in KGNC Radio in Amarillo, Texas. He told me the rest of the story. And then I would go home and started with Walter Cronkite, which dates me a little bit. Then being a good Texan, it became Dan Rather, and then it just kept going to different people. But Paul Harvey had it right, I think. The news ought to make you feel better. But there's none of that going on now. And I, I was very discouraged. But I was, as they talked, I thought, we're not supposed to be so angry with our neighbor. We're not supposed to be so angry with those around us. We're meant to take care of each other, to help each other. That's God's ideal. And we have left God's ideals behind. The Ten Commandments are still in the courtyard right outside the main doors of the courthouse in Dumas, Texas. I went and looked at it again because I'm always worried that somebody's going to take them away because I've seen that on TV, them removing the Ten Commandments. You'd have to have some sort of confidence to remove the Ten Commandments. These were the bedrock principles that a godly nation would be built upon. These principles, while they're Old Testament principles, still represent solid thinking on how to be godly as a nation. Nine were quoted in the New Testament as commands as well. Luke 10, 25 through 28 is a text where Jesus shares the core message or core commands of the law. It's simple. The law is about loving God and loving one another. Wouldn't you like to live in a world where that was the law? Well, in the Lord's church, that's supposed to be where we live, where we love God and we love one another. And I, I wish that that would extend to the community around us. Here are the Ten Commandments. It says... And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. 
Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or it's in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Real quick right there. If a generation comes up that hates and resists God, that is not just visited on them. It is on their children and their grandchildren. And we should think about the implications of the future when people abuse God that way. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant, female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I told someone just yesterday in a counseling situation, you know, your problem is you never take a day off. You never slow down. And they said, well, you know, the eager beaver and the bird that gets the worm, I don't know why you want to be a bird that gets a worm, but there is a sense from God in taking some time. Taking some time. Number five, honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Paul called it the first command with a promise. You'll live long and do well in the land. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. You know why? It's not yours. You need to focus on yours. The first four commandments call us to loyalty to God. No other gods, no graven images, no taking God's name in vain, no devaluing the Sabbath, the day the Lord gave. Commandments 5 and 7 call us to loyalty to the family, honoring parents, not committing adultery in our marriage relationships. Number 6, 8, 9, and 10 call us to loyalty to other people. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't lie or bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't covet for a person or covet for an object that belongs to your neighbor. Loyalty to God, loyalty to the family, and loyalty to other people. That's what I think America needs more than ever right now. There are three things we're to learn from this ancient text. A nation and its people must be loyal to God or they will face failure. A nation and its people, number two, must be loyal to family and honor the covenant of family and marriage or they will face failure together. Number three, a nation and its people must be loyal to their neighbors, loyal to others around them, or they will all face failure together. We must honor God, His name, His example. Be loyal to Him above all others. We must honor marriage and the marriage covenant. Be loyal to what God intended for those who marry. We must show honor to our neighbors. Serve our neighbors as we try to share with them the way to follow Christ. Jesus broke that down into a smaller piece. He gave the Hebrew Shema, it was called. As you walked inside a door, you would touch the door frame and you would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's amazing how Jesus made the Ten Commandments concise and understandable and how God had been doing that through Scripture. A lawyer came to Jesus and sought to put him to the test. Now that doesn't mean he was seeing if he knew the answers. It meant he was trying to trick him, trap him. Saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Now he should have just done high fives with everybody and left the area. But instead, he still wants to try to trick Jesus. So the lawyer has a new question, Luke 10, 29. Who's my neighbor? Oh boy. The Jews could fight over this all day long. Is it your extended family? Is it the people that live right around you? Is it the people of your own tribe? Is it the people that are Jews? Or is it the people for a certain area, certain community? What exactly is your neighbor? And they would argue about that. And the Jews really liked it to be their tribe. But that wasn't the way Jesus will apply it. Jesus told him the story of the Good Samaritan. Man went on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, a road they called the Bloody Way because it was so known for violence. He fell among robbers. They left him laying in the street. A priest came by. Well, this ought to work out well for this Jewish man. But the priest walked by on the other side of the road. Levite walks by. Now see, this really works good because he's the guy that knows all the rules for how you're supposed to practice Judaism. And he just walks on by. But a Samaritan came along, the hated enemy of the Jew. And he took care of the man, took care of his wounds, put him on his beast, the King James says, and took him to the inn and made sure he was taken care of. The one you would never expect it from was the one who did the great thing. The ones you would expect it from are the ones who left hurt instead of answers. Did you know that today there are a lot of people where if you told them religion passed by and didn't help, they'd go, yeah, that's what we expect. We've got to do better than that. Jesus then asked the lawyer another question. Luke 10, 36, Jesus asked, Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer knew the answer. It was the Samaritan, but he couldn't say that because he hated Samaritans. So he said, The one who stopped to help, the one who showed him mercy. And he said, You go and do likewise. I think we would do well to go back to the Ten Commandments as far as a nation goes. I think as individuals we would do well to go back to the great command Jesus talks about. And we would do good to learn from the Good Samaritan story all over again. One of the stories I saw on the news was about two people of a different race, one attacking the other. That goes directly against what Jesus is teaching here. There shouldn't be hatred like that among people. But if there is, the Lord's church shouldn't participate in such things. I think we've lost a lot of the basic ethic and morality of Almighty God. We need to go back to loving our neighbor, being loyal to God, being loyal to our family. When we don't do that, we have problems. Last week we looked at America's need of being loyal to God. 
This week we're going to look at the need of being loyal to family and then to others. Honoring your parents. Honoring the, not just parent, but the guardian who cares for you. For the adults in your family who looked out for you. Honoring them is very important. Keeping marriage undefiled, not committing adultery is very important. Strong families make a strong congregation. The families that have harmony with each other are the backbone of everything that we do. Strong families make a difference and they make us all better and do more for us. And that's true for our country as well. It's not a new thing that families are falling apart. It's been with us a long time. I remember when Alan was in second grade, they called me and they said, uh, Chris, do you want to coach the baseball team? And I said, what? Uh, I'm happy to come to the games. I'm happy to do things to help, but coach them? You said they practice four times a week. That's a lot to me. And they said, well, you're one of two dads on the team. We're going to need both of you to come coach. Isn't that crazy? And that was not recently. As y'all might understand, I'm no longer that same 30-year-old running around. As the family has crumbled, so have we all in this country. Many of the problems we face in our society have come from homes in chaos, broken families, abusive situations, neglect, lack of discipline, and so much more. And I hate to even talk about it because our first instinct is, is to turn around to those who have problems and go, see, that's the problem. But the honest truth of it all is, if we were a smart congregation, we would get involved in prevention of families falling apart. If we were a strong country, I think we would do that as well. It is certainly possible for a healthy home to produce an unhealthy child. It's certainly possible for an unhealthy home to produce an incredible child. But that home experience is elemental to us. It's vital to us. It makes such a difference to us. An author named James Moore wrote a story I thought was funny about parenting and sort of clipped it to put in a lesson sometime. He tells a story about a little boy named Bradley. We have a Bradley. I probably should have changed the name so Bradley Gilmore didn't think we were talking about him. This little boy named Bradley. Bradley was eight years old, and Bradley came to the conclusion that his family and really the world owed him everything. It's an attitude we see often in our society. So one morning, Bradley came down to breakfast, and he put a piece of paper all neatly folded right next to his mother's plate. When his mother opened up the paper, hoping she was going to see something saying, I love my mom, or a drawing, or something like that, this is what she read. What mother owes Bradley for running errands, $3. Taking out the trash, $2. For sweeping the floor, $2. For extras, $1. Total of what mother owes Bradley, $8. And you can tell this was a while back, because that's really getting off pretty cheap. <coughs> His mother didn't say a word. At lunchtime, when Bradley appeared at the table, she handed him $8 and said, I got your bill, here's the pay. He was so excited, he took the money, stuffed it in his pocket, and was already beginning to dream about what he was going to buy. Then he sat down at his plate for lunch, and he noticed a little piece of paper folded very neatly right beside his plate. He picked it up and opened it, and this is what he read. What Bradley owes mother for being good to him, nothing. 
for preparing his meals and cleaning his room? Nothing. For providing clothing and toys? Nothing. For nursing me through the chicken pox? Nothing. Total of what Bradley owes mother? Nothing. Because I love Bradley. Bradley didn't say a word. He just got up, pulled the money out of his pocket, handed it to his mother, and hugged her. See, that story didn't turn out the way you were thinking it might. The mother didn't say, you owe us $70 a night as a hotel room and all that. But that kind of grace and mercy and care and love goes a long way in a family situation. We need to learn and we need to work to have harmony in our homes. Kids need to come to understand what parents and guardians do for them and respect it, honor them for it. I think that's one great benefit of mission trips like the one we took to Belize. Those kids are sitting there looking at what they have and they go, ooh, I've got so much. I think it's an awesome thing. I loved when campaign groups would come to Ukraine and they'd say, wow, Ukraine doesn't have good sidewalks. And I said, most of the world doesn't have good sidewalks. We learn how blessed we are in our families. I almost wish we could make every teenager go on a mission trip, but I don't guess that would be possible. But I think we are to certainly make it possible for them if they want to go. As we grow older, we appreciate our home we grew up in more and more. It's the home where we receive our first instructions in the virtues of life, where we receive our first lessons in what is right and what is wrong, where we receive our first experience of someone that loves us even when we have messed everything up, where we receive our first encounters with true faithfulness. Strong homes produce a strong, virtuous family as a nation. That's why I would say to you today that what America really needs is a sense of loyalty to the family. But there are challenges even beyond the things that happens within a family's home. The American family is receiving incredible pressures from the outside. Our TVs, laptops, telephones, and the ease of accessing harmful pictures, lyrics, quotes, and values is destroying our children and our teens and destroying our, our nation from within. Morality and ethics are being changed from the Bible principles that have defined what is true and noble for generations to human thought and flawed ideals that have never been proved to work. The sanctity of marriage is under attack. Biblical gender roles are under attack and beliefs that have been held for centuries are suddenly being questioned as people think they become smarter than God. Unless we return to God in His wisdom, moral, and ethics, we're going to continue to be a broken home for the citizens of this nation. I have seen a world power break into pieces because they shunned God and trusted only in themselves. I watched as the Soviet Union crumbled. I watched as democracy, free enterprise, and the return of religion, the ability to have a Bible, energized Ukraine and changed it incredibly from the inside out. I've seen how desperately Ukrainians are willing to fight to keep their freedom. They don't want to go back to government religion. They want to be able to choose their own. They want to have their own Bible. I've watched as politicians, college professors, and news people try to steer us back to what Ukrainians are fighting to the death to leave behind. One of the things I heard today was, they said, well, we all have to admit, socialism is, has nearly all good parts. And I went, there's not a Ukrainian in the world that would sit for that. They'd hate that, because they know that only the rich are blessed under such times. I pray that we have strong families and healthy homes. This congregation should be bound and determined to make that the product of what we have here. And I know of incredible families and homes 
here at Faith Village. Third, America really needs a sense of loyalty to others. The other four commandments, 6, 8, 9, and 10, are a how-to manual showing us how we are to do what Jesus called us to do, to love one another and stop hurting one another. I was going to leave this out because people always seem to roll their eyes, but I think you know that my favorite TV show has been the same TV show since the day I was born. On May of 1965, the number one TV show in this country was The Andy Griffith Show. Oh, it's just never grown old to me. And I've never seen another show where I was going to say, okay, this is now my favorite. Brenda doesn't ask me anymore where we go on vacations because I went to Mount Airy, North Carolina, the town that Mayberry is based on. And we sat in Andy's chair, and I got inside the Darlin's truck and all this stuff. I was so happy, and Brenda and our son Daniel just kept staring at me going, this is the most boring place on earth. But it wasn't. It was incredible. I sang the Mayberry High, Union High class song in front of the door of the school, all those different things. It represents a snapshot of what the world was like when I was a little boy. And I miss it. I would love for my grandchildren just to be able to run down any street and know the names of everybody they pass I would just love that. I would love for us not to have to x-ray candy on Halloween. I just think that'd be great. I would love to be in a funeral procession driving past a field and see football players get down on a knee again. I, I long for the things that I remember as a child. And as I get older, I get much more stubborn about the whole thing. The thing I love about a at Mayberry is it was a community of neighbors who sought to fix each other's problems, even if you didn't really want them fixed. They sought to help you through hard times. They sought to make the community and themselves better. Even though there were times where everything fell apart, by the end of the show, it was all put together masterfully. It was a community of neighbors, Sheriff Andy Taylor, ruled in the courthouse, his son Opie running back and forth between the house and the courthouse, Aunt B, who cared for Opie, Helen Crump, school teacher, Floyd the barber, Deputy Barney Fife, Thelma Lou, Gomer and Goober Powell fixing cars at the filling station, Ben Weaver at Weaver's department store, Emmett from the fix-it shop, Mayor Pike, and then Mayor Stoner, the pharmacist, Ellie Walker, Howard Sprague, the county clerk, and there's just so many more that walked through that community. They were there for one another. They were flawed. They made mistakes. Everybody notices I just didn't put Otis Campbell in the list. Even he was flawed, but even he was redeemable and had redemptive moments. What's that? Ernest T. Ernest T. Every now and then I want to throw rocks. I watched um, <coughs> the one today where he fell in love with Miss Crump. That's just, that's just really funny. They were there for one another. They helped one another through hard times. They celebrated good times together. When any one of them had a need, they responded because they were neighbors. And being neighbor, a neighbor to someone was like a contract you had with them. Didn't you have a neighbor where when you left town they watched your house? I could go to my neighbor right now and say, would you like to watch my house? And he'd say, um, you're standing on my flowers or something like that. But I don't see the same feeling I want to tell you something pretty interesting. Sue and Diane went on vacation. Does anybody know where they went? Dumas, Texas. <laughs> Boy, they're going to find out. It is not what I remember. 
but I loved growing up in a place where every adult knew who I was. Nobody was going to hurt me there because I had too many guards. In fact, my dad's police department covered the whole town and even out into the countrysides. But neighbors took their job seriously. And they may not go to church with you. They may not go to church at all, but they were very ethically bound to making sure you were okay. If someone broke down by the side of the road, you weren't scared. You were interested in who it was you're going to be talking to for the next few minutes. I still see some of that today, but I miss the neighborhood that was our communities. My grandson was telling me why he likes Sesame Street so much, the four-year-old. Um, I don't like Elmo, but I pretty much like most of the rest. But he said they live close to each other so they can help each other. And everybody needs help. And as I sat there and looked at Josiah, I thought, yeah, we all want to live in a place where people there are going to help us. People where you can tell them you need help. Neighbors. We are surrounded by a community of neighbors. Because when Jesus was defining neighbor by asking the question, who was a neighbor to this man? It's the person you can help that's your neighbor. Not the person you like the most, the person you have the most in common with. It's the one you have the ability to help. And we can all help our neighbor. We must love our neighbor. That is from the Greek word agape, which means a love that will sacrifice itself for one another. Times have changed, but not completely. You ever found a good neighbor out there when you didn't expect it? That was awesome. There was a lady whose tree fell down in the recent wind storms. They refused to call them tornadoes, so I don't know what they are, but they said microburst. I know what micro means, and that wasn't micro. But she had a tree split down the middle, and it was laying across her driveway, and five guys were out there with chainsaws just destroying that tree into a million pieces. They could have made toothpicks out of it. But I was sitting there looking at him going, look at that, Wichita Falls. These guys are all out there in a driveway trying to help her. And there's value in those moments. Sometimes people in the world don't act like neighbors to each other. We can't change it. But we are Christians. We have no choice but to be the right kind of people around those who need our help. This is the key to saving them and the key to giving our nation what it needs most and that's being kind and caring to those around us rather than angry and wrathful. I want to share with you a story about George Washington. I'm sure history books today say this story isn't true. Because most of the stories about George Washington, they've said, oh, no, no, that's not right. Um, I heard this from Mrs. Leathers in third grade, so I know it's right, because she was really smart. She could read all the books. After the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress did not have sufficient money to pay the soldiers for their effort. A group of rabble-rousing soldiers got mad about that, and they stirred up other soldiers and they formed a rebellious army intending to march and overthrow the new government. It was thousands of people strong. It was at that point that they were confronted by one man, the general, George Washington. Washington said this to them, If you continue in this manner, you will open the floodgates of civil discord and you will drown this new nation in blood as brother fights a brother. They seemed to pay no heed to him. They were determined to take the power of the nation for themselves. 
And it was at that moment that General Washington remembered that he had in his pocket a letter from the Continental Congress. A letter of pledge that was going to make sure that every soldier received every penny they were owed, even if the leaders of the country had to sell everything they had to make that happen. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out the letter and he opened it up and he tried to read it, but he couldn't see the little letters on the page. So he started reaching into his coat and finally he pulled out his spectacles and he was able to read. Before he read a word, the men began to surround their general. They couldn't stand to see him look frail. They couldn't stand to see him look confused or old. They broke ranks and they gathered around the great general and hugged him and they wept and there was no rebellion. One year later, Thomas Jefferson, writing on this incident, said, listen, the virtue of George Washington in that time of crisis prevented the loss of the freedom this nation had just dearly won. Virtue changes everything. God has taught us how to have virtue. Virtue is just the medicine our society needs. That to me, is our hope for change. I don't think you can pass a law and make people act better. But I think when people see kindness, caring, and virtue, it changes them on a very elemental level. God taught us in His Word how to be those kind of people. And that's what we must be. What does America really need? You could look at this a question a million different ways. But the way I looked at it was this. Number one, America really needs a sense of loyalty to God. America really needs a sense of loyalty to the family. And America really needs a sense of loyalty to others. I'm thankful I had the chance to share a few lessons with you. I'm tired I'm tired of being frustrated with things going on around me. I think we ought to work and try to be the answer at such times. <coughs> we always want to offer an invitation if it is, uh, if you have a need. We've already had two baptisms today. I wouldn't mind having a few more. That would be just awesome. Or if you need prayers for strength and encouragement, <clears throat> if you need to confess sin, anything that you need, you can let us know and we will pray with you and we will help you as best we can. Let's stand and sing number 552, Have Thine Own Way. We'll just sing the first and last verse since the bell rang. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way, hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, all shall sing, Christ only always living in me. May God bless you through the rest of this week. May you come back and be with us on Sunday. You're dismissed.